Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, or some translations, let us hold grace by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace, asking that you would help us to fix our hope rightly on this grace that's set before us, and that we would encourage one another to pursue this grace, that none of us would fall short of it, and that we would be encouraged and strengthened in our love for one another even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what brings you to love someone? To actually give of yourself to bring good to another. The Bible is full of commands to love people, isn't it? Often with implications of self-sacrifice. And and, uh, this type of love is a sacrifice. It's a cost to ourselves, our time, our resources. In our passage in Hebrews today gives us some commands to love. Now, we could have just started in right at verse 13 and give us a bunch of to-dos. What's love look like? What do we need to get out and do? And so often we do that in the Christian life. We just jump to commands and we tell one another, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. And often we just find ourselves doing it in our own strength, motivation of, of pressure from others or 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 fear that we're not doing right, but there's not always a positive motivation in it. But the context of these commands is what we've seen in the rest of Hebrews. Hebrews 13 is providing specific practical instruction in how to live out what was introduced throughout the letter, and particularly in chapter 12, where we read about worship that's pleasing to God. Look back again at verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, we're getting this grace, this belongs to us in Christ. Out of that, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. There's a connection here between what we're receiving, all that we have in Christ, and offering, living out acceptable worship worship to God. Now, we talked last week about this worship language, ascribing worth, valuing. Uh, Worship is about our, our hearts valuing something. And when we have gratitude, we are basically valuing and treasuring God's grace to us. How would you define gratitude? I think a feeling of gladness that you feel towards somebody when they've shown you undeserved kindness is at the core of what gratitude is. There's, there's a gladness. It's expressed. It's, it's felt. And the more undeserved the kindness that we've received, and the greater the kindness we receive, well, the more gratitude we have. The, the more impulse we have to, to show this gladness. Say, for example, uh, you can say thanks for someone when they pass the salt. That's different then when you say thanks to someone who's donated a kidney for you. There's a difference between just thank you for a a common courtesy versus a gratitude, a gladness for your life being saved, and and not just saved, but brought into ultimate joy and glory. So if we have our eyes opened, if we've been granted faith to see how great a salvation a deliverance we have, into the, and having the keys to Zion City, as we said, this home with God and Christ. And if we value all that God is for us in Christ, then our gladness is a response to this grace. And that gladness, that response, is the means by which, verse 28, we may offer to God an acceptable worship, a worship that's pleasing to him. It's acceptable because it values what God has done by his grace. 
Last week we talked about this a little bit when we were in chapter 12, that, that anything we do is only acceptable to God when his grace is at the center. I think Paul, he counts everything else as filthy rags except for that which he has in Christ. And when he's at the center, then it, it's acceptable. But it's not acceptable if it doesn't flow out of treasuring his goodness and treasuring this, this grace that we didn't deserve. And as we look at Hebrews chapter 12 and, and what we've seen throughout the epistle, this, this gladness that we have is not just for past grace, not just for receiving forgiveness in the past, but what's set before us for the kingdom that we're receiving, that we're going to be brought into. You see this motive for living in little points along the way in Hebrews even. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. He's talking about some of the things they had done before in their faith walk. And it says, you had compassion on those in prisons. Why later on? Since you knew that you yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. That, that compassion was motivated by this future grace. So, so we understand that there's a gratitude that, that joyfully responds to the, the benefits of what we received in the path, but there's, their past, but there's also this, this trust that relies on the benefits and the joy we get in the future, the, the grace that's yet set before us, what's coming to us. And, and so this trust, this faith, is basically relying on God and his promises. And and seeing them better is the other ways of the world. And it works out pursuing the things of God. And particularly, it should work out in love. We love because he first loved us, and his love compels us. And so chapter 13 fleshes out concrete examples of a Christian's acceptable Worship, acceptable valuing of God and his ways. And today we're just going to look at two, two aspects of the outworking of grace. And the first is love towards fellow believers and then love towards strangers. And what we need to see from this is part of what our worship agenda is. When I say worship agenda, our our value, what do we value? And and do we have these things at the center of of our outworking of God's grace? Our valuing of him is following his ways. This should be part of our response to the gospel to the good news of what we receive. And and so we're going to start out with looking at love to fellow believers. The term love is used in so many ways in our culture and our context. It can be confusing. We can love a day off. We can love a certain food. We can love a person we don't know because they look good, which is more like lust. Or we can give ourselves out. I was reading on people interacting with Jonathan Edwards' way of dealing with love, and he divides it into two main categories, and it was helpfully expressed this way. You might think of the difference like this. Isn't there a difference between when you say, I love pizza, versus when I say, I love my enemy, or I love my neighbor? The same word, love, but there's a big difference What do we mean when we say I love pizza? It it means that I I find something that I'm pleased with in the qualities of the pizza, right? It delights my taste buds. I'm responding to that good because I enjoy its goodness, and then I I act to seek it out and try and order pizza at least twice a week, right? Waistline aside. So when I say... Love my enemies, though, or love my neighbors, it's not quite the same, is it? It's more about my goodwill toward that person, to do them good. I'm trying to bring about good. So so this isn't defined in terms of warm and fuzzy feelings that I have about some quality in the other person, but it's in terms of my behavior toward that person. Right? Instead of responding to the good and loveliness I'm trying to bring about good. There's a 
the difference. So which way are we to love fellow believers? I think sometimes we can think about that first kind of love, like we love pizza, towards people. And then what can happen? If I don't find something pleasing in that person, then I can easily choose to ignore it. I'm not going to have any of, of that. But if it's a second kind, then I, I really don't need to wait to see if they have a delightful quality to want them to do them good. I have a different resource that's motivating me other than just their own loveliness. Now, one level, we should love all people, and there is some loveliness because we're all made in the image of God. And to brothers and sisters, we all are joined to the same God by faith. But, but inherently, we can move towards others in love, a giving of ourselves, because we have a resource that's not just based on their loveliness. In fact, isn't that how God loved us first? Not because we were deserving, but because he was merciful and loving. So I think our passage today definitely connects to the the love that does good for another. And it it flows out of worship, out of grace received, a a glad response to who God is for us that flows out towards other. And so verse 1 of chapter 13, let love of the brethren continue. Or more literally, let Philadelphia remain. Not not talking about letting the city keep standing. Philadelphia, as you understand, is is a compound word made up of the Greek word for love and for brother. Let brotherly love continue. And the term for brothers, even more so looking at that word, it was normally used for actual blood relatives. It, It means those from the same womb. And Philadelphia then refers to the love members of a family have for each other, to love those who come from the same womb. In that culture, you particularly understood this. There was a a kinship and a closeness of family that you're you're willing to do stuff for family, even though they can be a pain in the neck sometime. There was still always something that you could do. We understand that a little bit today. Your brother needs help on his car and to hold the wrench, and you might not even get along, but you go help him. There's something connected about family that we do. So when Christianity comes along, it transforms these terms and says this is what it's to be like among God's people. Fairly radical principle that the church should be a family. We're not brothers and sisters merely because we have similar ideas or hobbies or circumstances, but because we share the life of Jesus. Not by natural birth, but by spiritual birth. If you're familiar with your Bibles, we understand that the Bible talks about those who have faith in Christ as those who have been born of God or, or born from above, particularly in 1 John and the Gospel of John. It uses this term that we are born of God. We have God's seed in us. And and Paul talks about how we're a new creation. And our hearts have been changed. We were dead, but now we are alive. And, And this is the result of God putting his spirit within people that changes their affections, but also it makes them part of the family of God. We are joined to Christ in union with him, in union to others who are in Christ. We share the same faith, the same hope, the same salvation, the same inheritance in Zion City. We all have the same Father. And Jesus, back in Hebrews chapter 2, calls us brothers. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. So all over in the New Testament, we have this family-like love that's encouraged. And this is part of the basis for what we should have as community within the church. It's, it's fascinating. This, this isn't a char- call to maturity. Love between believers isn't a sign of maturity all the time. We see actually in 1 John, it, it's a mark of saving faith. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, brother being used as a fellow Christian, he's a liar. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
So what we see here is there, there's an assumption that when we come to Christ and in Christ, there is a bond that transcends natural bonds, even biological bonds. It's, it's more deep, deeper and it's more lasting than what we have with blood relatives. And it spans ethnicity. Think of Ephesians. You have Jews and Gentiles joined together. You have this spanning of social status, educational background, whatever it is. The church is not to be just based on natural affinities. We all have the same hobbies and things like that. It's to be grounded in the same life of God with the same inheritance. And and, and so we see this mindset through the epistles, not only in the commands to love, but in the address of one another. What's the most frequent address? We, we see terms like saints, but we also see brothers or brethren like in our passage today. Appealing to this family connection. I think I, I've told you before that before I was a Christian, when people used to call each other brothers, I just assumed they forgot each other's name. But it was really, well, it might be that too, but it's really uh, supposed to be an appeal to this connectedness that we have. And so we're called to have this care for one another. And let love continue, verse 1 says. They're they're stuck together. And apparently they've been stuck together and it needs to continue. What they were doing before, they need to continue to do. They've endured together through things and they need to keep at it. Remember again back in chapter 10? look Look at verse 32. He's calling to mind their former days together when it seems like they were earlier in their faith. They had common struggles. They had persecution. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. They're in it together. And and sometimes they were publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and, and sometimes being partners. They were partners with those who were treated that way because they were apparently being persecuted for their faith, their identification in Christ. And these are people who probably left Judaism, all their social circles before are, are, re, are gone, and, and so the church is supposed to be what they're connected to. This is now where their family is. And you, you clung together through those struggles. Don't stop doing that. Continue in that. Keep loving. This isn't talking about just an occasional good thing. You're joined together and you need to persist in it. Remember, what's this letter about again? What's the main theme of this letter? It's about perseverance in the faith, endurance, holding fast the common confession of Christ. But part of holding fast to that confession is how we live our lives, and it also means holding fast to one another. It means enduring in the outworking of this faith and grace, and that's love. So what's that look like? How do we apply this? This isn't meant to be some theoretical thing, right? We're moving to the practical. You look throughout church history, especially in the early days, some of these deeds and care for one another is what made Christianity stand out. And we'll see some more of these things and outworkings in our own day in the next weeks. But, but think even back to Acts. Remember Barnabas, Acts chapter 4. Here the church is gathered together in Jerusalem, and they had great need. So here's Barnabas, and he actually goes and sells a piece of property, and he takes all the money from the sale And he gives it to the church to meet the needs that he sees around him among the brethren. He didn't cling to his own rights and his own possession and and, and even his own opulence. No, he gave it away when he saw a need. and, And that's really the essence of brotherly love, isn't it? This isn't limited to just their culture then and there. We need to figure out how to map this to here and now. We need to actively consider how to do it. I'm going back to Hebrews chapter 10 again, verse 24, if you're still there following some of the other discussions that we have in Christ. He says, let us 
consider, let us be concerned about, let us think carefully about how to stimulate, how to encourage, how to motivate one another to love and good deeds. Part of the the loving that we have towards others, part of our goodwill towards others is to help them in their faithfulness and their confession of Christ and, and how they can continue in the path of obedience as well. Not forsaking, verse 25, their own assembling together, their meeting together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So, so here we have something that's not just material goods, but there's an encouragement. And, and all through scriptures, you see all these passages of all the one another's. We should do this to one another, that to one another. That, that's part of considering others and loving others. It, it, it's, it's spending time. It's thinking about how to encourage each other in the faith. How do we get this type of mindset as well? We need to be with a person to, to consider where are they at and how might we encourage them? How do we hold fast to our confession? Again, this, this might be the only family they have. Ostracized from everyone else. And, and now you're going to forsake meeting together. Where are you going to get encouragement in the Lord if it's not from other believers? Where are they going to get it? In fact, when we looked at chapter 10, it's like if you, if you don't cling together to this family, you, you are on your own. You can die out there. But together, we have the kind of encouragement we need based on God's grace. And so we're to bring that to bear on one another. Active involvement, active engagement with others. Now, let's think about that. We're in a day and age, maybe we're not being persecuted, but again, we said these commands are still relevant. If a person's church involvement is is disassociated from others, how does that fit in with Hebrews chapter 10 and this command in 12 and in 1 John's portrait of those who don't love the brethren or, or you have to love the brethren. How does it fit with the outflow of grace into acceptable worship that we saw in chapter 12? That's a distorted Christianity. But that's so much what our, our, our culture sows into is this independence. And, and church just becomes one connection with so many other things. And we have so many different options. And and so if we, we don't get the kind of fellowship we need at church, we can get it at CrossFit or somewhere else. Pick your alternatives. Again, not that there's anything wrong with those things, but the kind of encouragement we need is the one that is centered on God's grace. So what impedes our brotherly love I think oftentimes, doesn't it come down to selfishness? That self-centeredness? We, we look after ourselves first and, and love shrinks. It just evaporates because we're turned inward instead of outward. Right? God made us to, to love him and love others. And so we're made to, to flourish. They're not only the greatest commandments, they're how we're made to live. Instead of us living this way, we start to turn it in to ourselves. John Calvin, when he comments about this verse, he says, when someone thinks more of himself than he ought, he will love others less than he ought as well. This works out in all sorts of ways. Maybe it's the not assembling together that we already spoke about. Or maybe it's not engaging when you do come. Or, or keeping things at a superficial level, or, or, or holding on to bitterness, unresolved conflict, it builds walls, or, or maybe it's gossip, or, or maybe we just make excuses to, 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 to protect ourselves, not give ourselves. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a people person. And then we think we don't have to get to know others. But, but that misses what Christ is trying to do. He is making a people for himself who are actually known for their love to one another. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 13, 35? He says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
This is a mark of discipleship. You don't earn discipleship. It's a mark of discipleship. So, so we need to each stop and think, what kind of relationships have you developed that have benefited another person in the church? And how can you grow? And how can you even grow in receiving these things? There's, we're all in different places, so we're supposed to love one another. It implies we receive love, and we need to be seeking to receive encouragement from others as well. Sometimes that's why we isolate ourselves, is we, we don't want to hear anything from anyone, and, and we don't give anything to anyone. But we need to consider, think about how we can do this or grow in it, and, and what obstacles need to be removed. You see, we, we need to understand that church is more than just people coming in a building and sitting in rows. It's people who are joined as family. Maybe it just starts with a small act of kindness. 1 John 3, again, verse 18, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Words are fine, but it can't stop there. The, the love of, of goodwill that reaches out towards others we, it means we, we might have to sacrifice some things, our comfort to reach out and associate with, with someone who's not in your normal circle. Small example, maybe after church you see two different people that you might talk to. Make sure that at least sometime you walk up to the one you're least familiar with. We may have to sacrifice our habits to spend time with those that we otherwise wouldn't have spent time with. Or you look for a need. This this doesn't have to just be on Sunday. What are the needs that need to be filled? You have a skill, you have an ability, maybe you can go help. And again, since church is people, not just Sunday, what about visiting with a single person or the widow? Maybe this, this is something you can do as a family, too. Well, I have to do this with my family. Teach them what it means to love others and bring them into ministering to others. Team up with someone else. How about speak to others in love? Speak the truth in love. Now, now that one could be tough. The goodwill we're talking about is the good that's defined by God. And, and sometimes that might mean saying hard things to people, too, right? Part of our loving is challenging them and trying to point them back to Christ. Sometimes we're unwilling to do that, not because we want to love them, but we want to protect ourselves. Love sets those things aside for their good, to try and bring good to them, doesn't it? It's not always easy, and we start to understand why we need to have God's grace in our life to endure in these things. Because why would we do this? Why would we do this giving? We, we need to believe that there's some more ultimate joy in loving others than just an exclusive focus on ourselves. We need to believe what Jesus said and Paul quotes in Acts, that it's better to give than to receive. We need to believe that this actually adds to our weight of glory when we minister to others. The Bible talks all over the place about rewards. Love your enemies And your reward will be great. This actually adds to our enjoyment of God forever when we love in these ways. This is back to the gospel, though, primarily. When we are freed from having to earn our way to to having to try and secure heaven, when, when we've received all that we have by grace, and I set my hope in all that my maker is for me, and valuing his ways, then then it's going to work out. I'm liberated from trying to get everything here. I could pour myself out if I would only see this grace that we've been talking about. I think the author of Hebrews helps us see some other ways that this love works out. We have love the brothers, and then next we have love of strangers. Verse 2. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Here he broadens out to a wider sphere from people you know to people you don't know. I was looking online this week uh, on books on hospitality. There are all sorts of them. I I don't know how search results work out. Was it 8,000 or something like that? But some of these are 
manuals on how to be successful business when you're in a, a service-oriented business. And, and some of these things are about how to set the table and how to have the lighting and the decor and all that. And that, that's fine. But this isn't primarily about tea parties where you have your friends over to have a nice social time. That's fine, but that's not this. This is first and foremost about love to people we don't know. Literally, it's don't neglect the love of strangers. It continues the theme of love. And this is another one of those compound words, hospitality is, that comes from two Greek words, which means love and strangers, love of strangers. So what's going on in the context of Hebrews in the first century hospitality it usually involved offering lodging as well as food and drinks to, to travelers who would come among them, even sending them with provisions on the way. Churches then, they, they often met in houses, and they, they had regular opportunities, even in that context, to practice hospitality towards traveling teachers or Christian business persons who were traveling, even refugees from persecution that might come by. And when they had these gatherings in the houses... Uh, you couldn't Google where to look up, but there was often word of mouth of, of where they met, and, and churches that were in other parts would connect with other churches and even give recommendations. Go stay with these people, and they knew there was a place to stay. So when believers were traveling, they'd try and connect in areas that they visited with the people there. You see examples of this at the end of uh, the book of Romans. Paul is giving his greetings in Romans 16. And he says to those in Rome, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. He's saying take care of her. A traveling Christian comes to worship, and, and you welcome them. Third John Speaking of strangers who were fellow believers and apparently some of some kind of Christian workers doing missionary outreach, he, he says to them, you do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. They've gone out for sake of the name. Therefore, we ought to support people such as these, that we may be fellow workers in the truth. That there's, there's a support that we have. There's a like-mindedness. And when we're helping them materially place to stay, we're actually helping the mission because that's how the gospel spread, right? We, we go and we take the gospel. Now, John and Second John also warns about supporting the wrong kind of people, but, but John very much affirms taking care of faithful laborers, even though they're strangers. So, so here's the sense back then. When people walk into the fellowship that you're not familiar with, you reach out. You put them up, you send them on their way, you pack a lunch, and, and it, it may cost you something. Time, resources, food. Now, we understand back then they didn't have the same kind of public accommodations. There wasn't the same Motel 6 or Hyatt's or whatever it is. So the inns back there were, were pretty sketchy places. They were kind of costly, low moral standards, some more like brothels than anything else, even dangerous. So obviously, not a real place of encouragement, even safety. It's, it's better to be with a Christian brother who who would receive them warmly into their homes and and shown love and family. It was culturally pretty important in those times, even Old Testament times among the Jews, it was part of being faithful to God. God commanded them to take care of the sojourner because you were once sojourners as well. And and he wants us to have that outward compassion towards others. And you, you read of things like even little lines in the book of Job. Job is, is wondering, why did this happen to me? And he's trying to contend for his righteousness, and he's pleading his case. And one of the things he says in Job 31, 32, the sojourner has not lodged in the street. I've opened my doors to the wayfarer. Right? That's, a, that's a, a picture of someone traveling through, and he's like, no, come in. I'll show you hospitality. You can probably think of several incidents in the Old Testament. One of the best ones is captured in, in Abraham's welcome of the three men who came to visit him in Genesis 18. 
So here's Abraham, and he's he's got his tent pitched out wherever he is. That was the Oaks of Mamre, I think it was. And his visitors came during the heat of the day. That's typically in that culture when they had their siesta, they would customarily take their afternoon nap. But Abraham, he just gives all that up so he can show proper hospitality to those who traveled to him. He, he offered them shaded rest and water to cool their feet, and he offers them a little bit of food and a morsel of bread, and then he brings out this huge feast. I don't know how fast they can butcher things there, but he got it around in time for dinner. And this is an example of hospitality. He gave of himself to, to take care of the needs of those who visited him. Now, of course, if you know the account of that story in Genesis 18, you know that one of these men turned out to be the angel of the Lord who promised him and Sarah that they would have a son the following year. He pronounced the blessing on them. And the other two were also angels. They went down afterwards to Sodom and Gomorrah where there certainly wasn't good hospitality. But Lot showed him some after some blatant neglect by others and abuse. But this is the type of example... I think that the author of Hebrews has in mind when he says, don't neglect like hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now he's probably not saying here, do this because you will entertain angels and go out angel hunting. That's probably not the point here. He's saying that some have done this in the past. They entertained angels and they were even blessed by it. But you know, Some of the strangers that we entertain, we might receive a blessing from too. If these are going out for the sake of the name and they're messengers of God, they can bring greater blessing than they actually receive, even human messengers. Have you ever done that before? Invited a missionary into your home, and and, and you are just so encouraged by the stories of God's faithfulness that's happened out in the mission field. You hear of their their tales and how God's provided, and it increases your faith when you've been able to participate in that. Or maybe you've been the object of that. I know when I went on some short-term missions trips, you you go to these foreign countries, and you are are put in little flats of these people. They're giving their best for for putting you up. And and you can hardly speak the language. Sometimes it's, you know, broken English, but they spend time, and, and, and we talk about things like how they came to faith. I liked it when I went to this one place. They didn't talk about how they came to faith. They talked about the day they repented. And and they talk about their life. And you're just encouraged by hearing of of God's faithfulness. And you you don't even know these people, but there's a connection there. And there's a a unity you have because of Christ. And there's a blessing in that. Now, this goodwill shown, grounded in this common unity in Christ, is is consistent with God's heart, isn't it? And so the New Testament, it makes for us hospitality a command. Yes, it's a a duty, but it's grounded in the gladness we have in Christ. Acceptable worship. Hebrews 12 talks about worshiping acceptably as well. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. But then later on, it it starts to flesh out some of the obligations. And one of them is contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Same thing, literally, pursue hospitality. This isn't, again, just a a a once-a-year thing. We think, okay, I did it at Christmas, I did it at Thanksgiving, now I'm good to go. But this is more of an attitude that we're pursuing. It's an attitude that stands ready to, to, to... to give strategic hospitality, to welcome people who, who ordinarily don't live here. And we don't know when that's going to happen, do we? How do we prepare for those things? But before we go into that, another example, First Peter 4, 8 and 9. Again, outworking of the faith. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another and be hospitable to one another. Here's this interesting part. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Implication is, you could complain, about showing hospitality. Don't do it with complaint or with grumbling or or grudgingly. What it means, it's something that you should want to do and like to do. This isn't just like, all right, the Bible says it, I guess I got to do it. Usually the commands are 
are grounded in who we are in Christ first. Same here. But this is, this is more uh, of a command that's based on being a certain kind of person. Namely, the kind of person that doesn't resent being hospitable. Does, doesn't resent the work. Yeah, it takes work. But because of grace, be the kind of person that doesn't look at the extra dishes or the, the bedding or the cost and, and grumble. Don't do that. In fact, in First Peter, the next verse in chapter 4, verse 10, talks about that we're doing this out of our, our, our stewardship of God's grace to you. Remember, this is an overflow of grace. Earlier we read that passage in Matthew 25. We're in the context here of of ongoing worship and valuing of what God has done in Hebrews. And, And we think this mindset probably goes back to even what Jesus said. And he said, I was a stranger and you took me in. And the people who were the righteous ones said, well, when did we see you a stranger? take you in. You remember Jesus' answer? As you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. About other believers. There's a connection there between believers and Christ. We're all joined to him. We're a part of the family. You take care you take care of my family, you take care of me. A friend of yours is a friend of mine. You know how this works, right? That there's a connection there. You do it to me. And this, again, isn't about earning salvation. This is a mark of those who inherit eternal life. So here in Hebrews 13, don't neglect it. Don't let it fall away from your practice. And there might have been temptations for that to happen. Don't neglect it. They they, they already knew to do it. They probably had practices in the past, but don't neglect it for whatever reasons. We can be tempted to do that, though. Neglect it. What do we do? All we have to do is is basically let our fallen tendency to self-centeredness just carry us in that direction, right? It's not neglected. I've got to be active to pursue it. If we just let our self-centeredness go, the result will be a life that is so full of self-oriented activity that there's no room for hospitality. And our lives can get so complicated that there's no room for strangers. We overschedule. We have all these activities that we need to be doing in in, in clubs and sports and and recreation and all these distractions waste countless hours on this and that. And, And it's largely focused on self instead of reaching out towards others. I understand some of this hospitality, maybe there's, there's some safety and wisdom issues that need to be considered. But there is another factor that must fit in each of our equations, and that is active love. Our treasure in heaven. Acceptable worship, which we are to give to God. But I think more often than not, our, our neglect is really a failure to have our hope anchored in this treasure It's a failure to connect to the grace we've received. And and so we fall short of our worship of God that works out towards others. And we limit our our worship of God to to singing a song or praying a prayer. But they're not at odds. The two greatest commandments again. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of it. Which means I have nothing left over for anyone else. But there's a second command, love your neighbor as yourself. So somehow, loving my neighbor must be connected to loving God for those two to fit together, right? And they are. I understand who I am in Christ and a child of God. And part of my love for God works out horizontally towards others. So we don't have that. We lose our zeal, similar to what we said before. If we neglect his grace to us, then we neglect our love to others. But positively, hospitality gives us an opportunity, a a privilege and a responsibility to let grace go outward. For, For each of us, not just the church, every Christian is called to practice hospitality, though 
we might not all practice it the same way. Through the ministry of hospitality, we, we share whatever God's entrusted to us for his glory. We're stewards, right? Everything we have belongs to him, and we're to steward it. And when we say steward it, we're operating in the interest of the master, what he says. And he says we're, we're called to love others, right? So, so how do we steward our resources? We, we can share our home, our finances, our food, our privacy, our time. Maybe you don't have your own place. You live with someone else, and, and it's hard to have people over. But we still have time. We can also share our hope. See, our love and our, our entertaining strangers, it, it doesn't just need to be material goods. It doesn't just need to be eating food or, or playing a game or doing something social. This is an overflow of having received grace. And I can use words to express that. Like I talked about the example of missionaries. We, we, we spoke God's grace to one another. We can have our our, our worship, our value flow out, shaped by God's will, aimed at his glory in Christ. And, and guess what? When we start to think this way, there are strangers among us, meaning there are fellow believers who are, who are passing through or those searching for a, a local body of believers to connect with, and they, they don't know many people here yet or anybody when they come in the door. And perhaps they're longing for some consistent community Who's going to invite them in and reach out to them? We, we could all just assume someone else will do it. But if everyone does that, of course, then no one will. May it never be that someone would show up to our gatherings for weeks and no one says a single word to them. But you know, I don't think that's the case here. I'm so encouraged when I see so many of you reaching out going intentionally across to meet someone new and greet them. And and, and I pray that that would abound more and more. And and, and some of us need to be challenged because we don't do it. It's too easy to neglect. And maybe we don't put them up overnight. But maybe it just starts with a warm greeting. Or, Or even before that, pray and ask God for eyes to see who you might welcome at church. And start simple. Learn their names and remember them. I need help remembering names. I got to write it down. So when you write it down, before you forget, remember the name and then make it a point to find them the next time you see them. And it's such a small thing, but it can be a crucial thing. And maybe you linger a little longer in conversation or you think about who you might take to lunch or dinner or invite over to your home for a meal or invite to one of our Bible studies. Consider how to do these things and plan for it. Don't overschedule. You don't have to schedule something after every event, after every service that you're out of here right away. Plan to hang around and and see what happens. Put on a crock pot so you can be spontaneous. There's a meal in there, right? And if someone comes over, you got enough in there, right? Love the brothers. was verse 1. We can do that. But don't get stuck in the rut of just going with those we've already made friends with. It's not just loving those who love you. Jesus said, don't even unbelievers do the same? But when we do this individually or together as teams, when we love outsiders and strangers, this shows something of the life-changing grace of the gospel. And as one author says, that has the fingerprints of your heavenly Father all over it. May we abound more and more in this our joy in Christ's glory. And so, Father, help us. Help us to love. And help us by seeing how much you have loved us and how much you've set before us and what a treasure in heaven that we've had. And out of this grace that we are receiving, shape us day by day to live according to your purposes and acceptable value of you in all of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.